Thank you to everyone who is helping us with our transcripts. You're doing a great job helping us make sure they're published together with the podcast. If you'd also like to help out with publishing the podcast, just email us hey at uxpodcast.com, H-E-Y or H-E-J. UX Podcast Episode 252. Hello, everybody. Welcome to UX Podcast, coming to you from Stockholm, Sweden. We are your hosts, James Royal Lawson and Per Axbom. Balancing business, technology, people, and society with listeners in 197 countries and territories in the world, from Azerbaijan to Switzerland. I always do wonder now if people have noticed the small little tweaks we have done in the intro. I hope some of them do. I'd like to think that people collect them. <laughs> We have for you today a link show, uh, which means that we have gone out on digital travels and we have collected two articles for you uh, that we will be discussing. And the first one out is, James. Undoing the Toxic Dogmatism of Digital Design by Lisa Angela. And the second one is Spotify adds stories, but is there any value to them by Michael Beausoleil. And we got really wet and damp while doing our digital travels for these ones. It's disgusting weather out there. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea where you were going with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, we're, we're, when we're recording this, um, it's the 11th of December. Yeah. And so far in Stockholm, we have had zero hours of sunlight yeah. during December. It is crazy. It's so dark. And just so everyone knows, mm. sunrise is at 8.33 today, and sunset was at 14.48. So we're almost down to six hours of daylight. Yeah. There we are. Merry Christmas to there you. There we all. are. <laughs> and on that dystopian note, <laughs> moving on. Uh, so this is an article that I'm so happy that Lisa wrote uh, and put out there. So Lisa Angela, she's a design evangelist for better process and education. She's a hardcore tricky and she's a science and public health nerd. And she's also uh, extremely well uh, articulated in uh, critiquing our design world. Uh, and her article, uh, Undoing the Toxic Dogmatism of Digital, digital Design, uh, I think it resonated so much with the both of us because it, it really calls out many of the different things that we've talked about over the years. But she's yeah, done both, it in uh, one Both post. privately and on the podcast. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of things that we've been fighting with in our, in our, you know, our careers, in our, uh, what we're observing in the design industry. And, and I guess, Per, a little bit of what some of the things that we've tried to fight with, correct, or help correct over the years as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so on, in the subtitle, she sort of describes uh, the article as uh, an effort to dismantle and rebuild a system that disempowers and excludes by design. And I mean, I mean she's not doing this in the article. She's calling it out. She's, she's calling for the conversations to happen to help us all deal with these issues. Uh, so what Lisa is saying is that the design practice is flawed. Design education is flawed. There's this paradox, I'm glad you mentioned that, that there's all these fantastic good uh, people with so much good intent. But and the, talent. Yeah, exactly. But the output, of course, sometimes just isn't quite up to par with what we say that we are putting out into the world. And so self-awareness perhaps is not our strong suit is one of our many points as well. Yeah. I think we're going to end up quoting a lot of mm. bits from the article, I, I don't think I've, when I've been making notes for link shows previously, I don't think I've ever m quoted this many bits from the article when I've been making my, my notes. It's, there's a lot of good things to say. One, one thing she says in the introduction um, about our profession as designers, name any other profession that could continually get away with the incredible inconsistencies in quality that we collectively generate. Yeah. <laughs> High and low, up and down. I quoted the same one in my notes. Uh, so yeah. I completely agree. I made a huge mind map here. And I think, and she also, she quotes uh, Will McAvoy from Newsroom, the first step in solving a problem is recognizing there is one. And I think 
I mean, over the past years, a lot of us are in agreement that there is a problem or many problems uh, in the design industry. Uh, and she summarized them so well in these yeah, exactly. seven I, I points. Exactly. I think the thing about the awareness mm -hmm. part, yes, there's a, there's a great amount of awareness, mm -hmm. but maybe we can't all put our finger on it. Yeah. Or maybe don't always want to admit, I say the whole thing about admitting what, you know, we know there's a problem, but maybe don't want to admit what the problem is. And of course, also there are powerful people out there who want to defend them, uh, defend the status quo, uh, which is something that Lisa also addresses in her post. Yeah, and the bulk of Lisa's post is actually um, a series of, well, top of mind areas um, where she thinks that um, things are just obviously not working um, as they should be in the world of digital design. So, so let's jump on to the first one. Uh, design educators and industry leaders have never reached a consensus about what comprises a good enough foundational education for digital design. So what happens then? And, and, and I mean, I can attest to this as well because I actually teach at a design school as you do. Uh, and when you talk to people after they've graduated and come out into the world, it is exactly as she puts it, they're not as prepared as they thought because it, we're not, uh, we're not, we don't have consensus around what we're supposed to be able to do. And of course, the people who hire us and employ us also don't know exactly know what we're supposed to do for them. No, and th that, that gap Lisa mentions about imposter syndrome is perhaps down mainly to mm -hmm. the fact that the, the, this mismatch between what we're educating, the mm -hmm. tools and processes we're giving students, and the, what the industry, how the industry works and how companies behave. Um, it's, a, it's a logistical nightmare. Um, and I, I think, I'll add that, organizations, I still don't think they know what they want or need. You know, we we see all these adverts for various you know, level positions, um, and when it boils down to it, especially in UX, I think we're all we're all individuals. We're all, I think, um, is it Gerard Spool and we've put it like this as well. Broken comb people. Mm. We have different competency levels in different areas. Some of us are very broad, some of us are quite narrow, but we all have different levels. And you know, you can't throw out one comb or lose one comb, expect to find an identical broken comb to fit, you know, the slot. Right. But they ask for the same comb every time to fill their old comb slot. And that's a good point. But it also, it, I mean, for me, it, it feels like then that we are completely failing as an industry to explain what we are about and the value that we bring. From a mm -hmm. meeting I had recently with students, it, it seems like they're so concerned with learning the right tools as in software tools for making interaction design because that is what people are asking of them when they come out to the workplaces. But we haven't taught them how to articulate what they really bring to the table, which is of course, mm -hmm. understanding what value you can create to help people out there. So, so that's to actually the quite business. good. It's a good point, Ben. It brings us on to number two. Mm -hmm. um, we do not properly retire methods or ways of conducting them, um, which have been shown to be ineffective. As, as in that section, Lisa talks about um, things that we've learned or taught ourselves over the years. She mentions journey maps and personas. Um, and, you know, you can uh, have your own opinions of whether they're useful or not and add new ones to the list. Um, that's not the point here. Um, the, the thing is that it's not the deliverables that, will, that really is what you're, you're, what you're working with. Um, and I, I wrote in my notes, death to the UX factory. You know, the whole thing about <laughs> just producing. Um, yes, exactly. You know, but but an issue here is that we've got. You mentioned this in the intro. There, are, I think, there's too many people out there whose whose job or career or book sales or whatever you want to call it um, relies on some of these methods surviving. Right. Or even from a teaching perspective, I mean, you yourself know how many hours go into preparing some of these courses. Mm. Uh, you, you know, you, it's it's infeasible to redo them every three months when we throw one two out and bring a new one in. Exactly. So then it really comes down to what am I teaching and how do I articulate that in a way that helps them understand the real skills and not the hard skills of software. Yeah. And we need to be more open and honest about what is working and what isn't and mm. coming to consensus as an industry. It's like, look, we're going to stop doing that. Mm. But it's, 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 it's a ch it really is a challenge. And I'm so happy she called out the journey map. She joked about maybe calling out personas, but the journey map for me has also become a symbol because so many of us have been selling journey maps as a deliverable that I've talked to clients that 
it, it's not that they're asking for a designer anymore. Some of them are actually asking for journey maps. They're not asking for value. They're asking for an artifact that doesn't necessarily actually produce any value in the end. Mm. Yeah. And I, I also dislike the whole brainstorming workshops. Mm. That, you know, you've been in over the years. You, you have these massive projects, maybe to to do whole new services or websites or whatever, and you know you you end up with like a three hour workshop with key stakeholders where everyone just writes nonsense on post-it notes, and <laughs> that's what we build. Because, you know, we don't do proper research. We don't have time for all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. We, know, we do token gesture stuff. But ultimately, you know, you, you just do what's on the five post-it notes that get pulled up at the end of the Exactly. Three -hour and that's what goes into the journey map is stuff mm -hmm. that you came up in a workshop and not the actual research that you're supposed to be doing. And because it looks pretty, it looks like there's been effort put into it. Yeah. <laughs> but we sell workshops. We mm -hmm. sell this process. We, you know, we have books that are written about it that encourage you to do it. And mm -hmm. It all kind of flows into it. I mean, it just keeps on going. Mm. And speaking of books and senior people, uh, point number three, design team seniority levels are meaningless. Uh, I love this because <laughs> I've seen so many people come into uh, their first job and being called senior within a year uh, for some reason. I don't know what the, of course I know why this happens. It's because then they can charge more for them. Well, uh, no, also I've got the, there's a quote here. Mm. Um, so in practice, companies hire mostly senior, uh, mostly seniors, sorry, because they don't understand what we do and don't want to have to train anyone. Mm. So this is this to me is a bit. Uh, this is just um, again supply and demand. I mean, we've uh, there are there's a genuine shortage of senior designers. We've expanded super fast in the last decade or so. So so when you do need a senior position, you can't fill it. So you have to then, and you don't understand what you're doing anyway as an organization, so you have to fill it, and you fill it with someone younger and younger, or m more and more um, junior, mm. because there's less and less senior ones to fill the slot. Yeah. So that's, to me, why we end up with that situation. Um, but it's also the of, case, I mean, that, I mean, we don't have any seniors. I mean, we haven't even defined what senior means, so of course you can mm. call anyone a senior. There's no law that says you can't. Uh, so as, as we basically destroyed our industry based on the previous point as well, that there's no education that tells anyone that this is what a designer needs to know because it's all different. Mm -hmm. And broken combs again. So uh, definition of, of education, mm -hmm. broken combs, trying to replace things you don't understand and don't understand the value of, lying to ourselves about methods and what works. And stuff. I mean, God, we're doomed to fail, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we're I'm, only on point four. I'm so enjoying oh. this though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, point four. Uh, we've collectively lost the safety and subsequently the desire to explore and fail. Uh, and what I take from this is what I'm seeing as well in the workplace, that we talk a lot about the importance of failing in order to learn, but we work in all these agile projects, we work in sprints, and we're supposed to deliver something at the end of three weeks or what, however you work in your company. And failing is usually not an option because you have to get on with it because we are still in... A, a world of waterfall systems where you actually have to be done by a specific deadline. And people do all these it's usability tests, not because they actually want to learn, but because they want to verify, is it good enough to release when we actually said it's going to be released because we've already set the release date. Well, arguably it doesn't make any difference. You don't have time to change stuff when you, based on the findings from, and how many times have you been in a project pair where you've managed to get usability testing in it, mm. you've then done the usability testing with enough time left and enough resources left to actually act on the findings from your usability testing before launch. Well, I, I actually have been in projects where I've had, there's been, well, in theory, there has been time. <laughs> you see? But nobody's <laughs> been interested in changing because it's no. like, okay, see, we, can, have... we can do that in the next release. <laughs> oh. It's it's, it's, it's a, even when you've actually get the testing in, it still doesn't really go. Yeah. Oh. And then I think we've all there's the you know we're going so fast and we're encouraged to cut mm -hmm. corners to go faster. And also I think w we've seen a lot of pushing for methods like A/B testing, mm -hmm. where you know it's seen as an easy way out. That well, if we just do if we just kind of produce two designs, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, we, two designs, push them out there, we know which one wins. We don't need to do anything else. Yeah. So, so that's I kind of I, become almost a, an industry standard process, even <laughs> though it's, it's flawed in so many ways. I have and a dangerous quote, in so quote many ways. from our article that summarizes this point so well. So we are dissuaded from generating multiple ideas, working through and testing concepts, and then throwing away what doesn't work, which is essentially the most fundamental parts of design ideation. 
So we're not even doing our work that we're supposed to be saying that we are doing it the way that they're supposed to do. Yeah. I'm just, yep. yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. That is. Number, number five. Um, uh, we afford well-known design leaders too much power to dictate how design is discussed and conducted. Mm. This is something that you and I probably talk more about in private. Uh, what comes to my mind is, because you mentioned books b before, and people yeah. uh, write books, they go out on UX conferences or big confer tech conferences, they do their talks, and, w and when you approach them afterwards, you just talk them to them for a while, and you realize, well, are you actually doing any design work these days? Well, most <laughs> of them actually aren't. Some of them sit in meetings and give advice around the things that they've written in their book, but they don't actually get down nitty and gritty and do the work. But there is a there is a lot of good mm -hmm. knowledge and a lot of good inspiration and ideas that comes from these talks and books and, and the rest of it. Pat, I mean, make sure we don't get the, give the wrong impression that these aren't useful things. Um, but um, you know, following fandom or kind of ideologizing people and, and focusing too much on the on the person and everything they say is not is not healthy in any aspect mm -hmm. of 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 life, I guess. And I think that's I mean, a good know, point. Yeah, and, and we also, I mean. Uh, it's this is not about us, but I know I know that me and you do actually put some effort into finding people who are not always the mainstream people to bring them on the show and, and get them to share their knowledges, knowledge mm. and and ideas and passion. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And also, don't get me wrong. I mean, that's why I enjoy talking to people is they put the effort into writing a book, which also means that they have thought uh, deeply about an issue and that makes them uh, experts on it. But as you were mentioning before, when we we're talking about education as well, once you cement it into a book and the book has some years, uh, been around the market for a couple of years, some of the ideas are tend to become outdated and sometimes they become more of a mantra than a one of the tools in the toolbox. It's like you're yeah. selling this idea and not as part of, because you haven't decided on the problem yet, have you? Mm. So it's not the solution to everything. And also mm. things, things have a very long life. Um, I mean, a, an example there is maybe even like Steve Krug's Don't Make Me Think. Mm. Um, I, mean, I even saw that, I think yesterday being used as a quote again to, as as a defense of a certain way of working design uh, design pattern right that you know it shouldn't make me think whereas you know we've discussed and we've talked about the fact that there are there are clear scenarios and situations where you really 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 do need to make the person at the other side of whatever you're designing think that's it's a really good point because sometimes these ideas that we have i mean even I even hear people quote like the old uh, Jacob Nielsen uh, tenets of you, you, you can't have more than three clicks for people to achieve their goal and stuff like that. Because the, mm -hmm. People quote things that they've heard over the years and they think still are truths. And you hear these from clients, not just designers. Usability testing with five people? Yes, uh, exactly. That this week as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they stick with people. And, and don't make me think since it was the title of the book, it really sticks with people. And it, it sounds so sensible. But once you get down into understanding the importance of friction, you realize that that can be very misleading. And this ties into number one about, you know, the consensus about what is good enough and what's the fundamentals that we need to know and understand and keeping that body of, of expectations and knowledge up to date. So we make sure people understand what is right now. I suppose it's like building standards. You know, when, mm. when a certain way of building a building isn't deemed safe anymore, you know, that information is propagated and said, look, you, that's not how architects work anymore. Yeah. This is the current standard. Oh, we that's a, such a good segue, James, to the next one, because, I mean, that's building architecture and safety. Uh, number six uh, of Lisa's points is we have no ethical standards. Uh, and, you, and you need the standards. You need these blocks, uh, uh, the pillars to stand on to actually feel um, comfortable with the work you're doing. Uh, and that also helps you to articulate and speak up when you think that we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, just, what, uh, just to, so I would have said it again, that, that we have no ethical standards. Yeah. It's actually a shocking five-word <laughs> sentence to, to, to read out. Yes. And what I think she articulates so well is that recognizing that we have this huge, huge power as designers. We affect so many people. And we still haven't incorporated ethics as required coursework for foundational design education. Yeah. Uh, it's um, it's worrying. It is worrying. Uh, and again, we are talking about it more, but uh, and of course, as usual, when you when you see these things and they become apparent to you, you become frustrated that things are moving so slowly. 
And I think that is that is this conversation, the conversation that Lisa wants us to be having and having it more often. Uh, and mm-hmm. I'm so happy she's encouraging that. On the positive side of things, you know, in the last five years, we've 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 seen an explosion in the amount of conversations around ethics and and design. Mm. Um, but as we know from our conversations on the podcast and from your work that you're doing with ethics as well and teaching you doing pair, that we're still in the beginning. And I think the more the more you dig into our problems with design ethics, you realize and learn about the problems with um, business ethics with you know some of the ethical questions in in society as a whole mm-hmm. rather than just our practices our, how we work as designers right and and, and it's uh, it can be a word that is becomes problematic as well because to cope with this attention to ethics now a lot of the big tech companies are uh, employing people who are said to be working with ethics ai ethics people and they put up ethics boards and then they close the ethics boards and then they hire people and then they fire people uh like the what's going on with right now with tim Gibru, who's fired from google and, and it's uh it just the, it's ethics washing is what's happening as well because if, so, if a topic becomes interesting to people the companies will say yes we are paying attention to this but of course we need more more much more transparency around what's happening and back to back to basics we need the education uh, to include this of course as well uh, so that there's something that we can all pull from collectively and reach consensus on that this is what we stand for point seven the final point um in the article um, inclusion uh, sorry Inclusive design and accessibility are afterthoughts, both in design education and in practice. Mm. Now, and she goes on to say that we've we've normalized this. Um, I know the whole thing where business says everyone outside the primary set of personas, <laughs> personas huh, um, is an edge case. And, and you know, the whole thing of edge cases is mm. something that has frustrated both me and you in many occasions, I think, Per, that edge cases are still people. Mm. And when you ignore or down prioritize um, edge cases, you're deliberately excluding groups. You're deliberately uh, potentially causing harm for certain groups um, and knowingly accepting that. And, and, and as Lisa put, put it, puts it as well, that these people that we are shortchanging or, or putting down and uh, not including in our efforts, they are already being shortchanged daily by the design of everyday things, but also by society, of course. So it's the people who we aren't listening to are never listened to. And so we're increasing the gap between the people who are always helped and benefited by the things we build. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the phrase, you know, mm. kicking someone when they're down. Mm. Um, it's that kind of thing that you're, you know, you're disadvantaging the people who are already disadvantaged, potentially, in many of these situations. Yeah, yeah this is the one that, I mean, this is the point that brings tears to my eyes because it's so obvious. It's It's not what design is supposed to be about, but it's one that, Every designer I talk to agrees about it's we're mm. we're just not paying attention to helping the, the people that matter. Yeah, and we've seen this over the years with especially when it comes to design maturity in organisations that when you have those initial conversations about accessibility, then it's almost always the the f- the first thing you get back as a response is well you know most of our users aren't blind, mm. or you know don't have ac- accessibility issues. So you know it's an edge case. Mm. It's you know we we'll deal with it later. We'll we'll fix that in the next release. So you know we'll focus on the eighty percent mm. and we'll leave the twenty percent for another day. Mm. And that's that's almost you can you can script this. You can go into meetings mm. and you know this is how it's going to be. But also, later never comes. Yep, that's what hurts even more. Later never comes. We can do it later, but later never comes. Unless legislation comes, mm. and then they're forced to have later now reluctantly and still without actually really caring about or it. Or they write an accessibility statement where they actually say, we're doing this later. Yeah, that works too. <sighs> yeah, and the point there is inclusive design should just be design. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is something too. I mean, yeah, we, mm. we far too often we're bunging words before words mm. <laughs> when we actually should just you know, bring this to its core and embrace it as what we do. Exactly. So there's all this kind of, I mean, if those are the seven things that are top of Lisa's mind, then um, whew, I'd hate to see the next um, seven or 20 that are less down the list because it's, um, mm. it's, it's a hard slog, but it's, it's a really excellent read and really makes you feel, I don't know what, I actually, I think I wrote to you, Per, when we 
when we first read this, mm. I, I kind of don't really know how it makes me feel. It, it, it makes me feel good that Lisa's wrote this, written this. Yeah. But then it, it kind of brings back so many memories of, of things over the years. And some of that stuff makes me feel less good. Right, and it, it, feel, it makes you feel responsible, which I think yeah. is, is a good thing. Uh, we need to feel more responsible because that is what will hopefully give us the energy to actually change things, to start mm. taking the next steps. And, and start having conversations. Mm. Um, Lisa says herself, start by being brave and open to having these challenging conversations. Mm. Um, we're not going to feel great about some of these things that we have to discuss. But we, we we need to do it mm. to get to the next step, next place, next um, point in our journey. Yeah. And as she puts it as well, we have to stop being apologists for the dysfunctional way we work. We need to be open about it. We need to talk about it. Uh, and I think it's something to talk with. If you teach at schools, talk about it. It's really, really important. And amplify um, the people who are saying the things that are right and true. Yeah. Um, and that is, I think, one of the reasons we're bringing up Lisa's article and spending so much time talking about it. Because it needs to be amplified. It needs to be amplified. You should be reading it. You should be talking about it. Uh, and you should also, of course, she's starting a podcast. Uh, you yeah, need to Far From the Valley yeah. is the name of the podcast. When it re It's meant to be launching um, at the end of 2020. And I think on the post, you can actually sign up to, to get to know when it's released. Yeah. The second article for today. Spotify adds stories. But is there any value to them? <laughs> uh, this is by Michael um, Bouchelet. And um, now, this... Um, uh, Basically, there's been, it seems like there's been a test cohort um, of Spotify users who've been exposed to um, stories. Mm. So, I, I'm, I'm, no, we can't presume that everyone knows what stories are. So, um, stories are those often little circles um, on social media platforms, um, usually social media platforms, um, that appear um, at the top of the app or the page. Um, with small snippets of content. Snippets is a word. Small small bits of content, um, whether it's a video or a picture or, or something. Um, and they're usually time-limited, that they aren't there forever. They're there for a, a certain amount of time before they vanish. Mm -hmm. And they're often in chronological order. It's usually tw often. 24 hours or something like that, stories, right? Uh, yeah, it seems to be 24 hours. Depending on platform, um, I guess. Yeah, now they, they originated on Snapchat, I think back in 2013. Yeah. Um, but it was Spotify, no, I'm sorry, it was Instagram that really made them uh, known mm. and understood, well, understood by a lot of people or recognized by a lot of people and, and loved, I guess, by a lot of people. Now, um, Spotify isn't maybe the first um, app or product that you would write up as being the next one to get stories um, so how do stories on, on, on spotify work does it mean i mean do i've read when i read it it's like the artists can post stories but at me as a user do i also post stories on on a on a song or on an album or how does that work the, the test the test appears to be mainly it's it's just artists mm. affect it's kind of like a random playlist it seems to be so it's mm. kind of like stories um of artists promoting their songs mm. So, so it, 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 to be honest, it seems like a really bad idea. But this is what's. But you know, if we just we can actually ignore the fact that it's about Spotify, because I think the the bigger thing about this article um, isn't the details um, of the Spotify test, because mm -hmm. I'm I'm really not convinced that it'll go beyond the test. I mean, Spotify trying all kinds of different things, and they've said I think in another article that this was just a bit of a test, and there's no guarantee it will make it to the product. But if you look at what's happened, we started with Snapchat, went to um, Instagram. Instagram, of course, then goes over to Facebook. Facebook has stories as well. And now we've also seen LinkedIn have got stories. Um, recently, and I know you love them, Per, mm. um, Twitter has added their own version of stories called 
fleets. If I remember that right. Yep, that's that's it. I see, I keep on I keep wanting to call them twits. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, that makes I, so much more sense to me. I, 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 but I don't know why that comes up. I just kind of like, mm. oh, we've got tweets and then they're twits. I don't know. Um, but anyway, they've got them too now. And because they're um, because they're fleeting. That's why. I think you're right. I'm yeah. mixing I'm mixing tweets and fleets mm. and getting twits. Yeah, mm. we should let them know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I can't. I'm so unbelievably frustrated with all this because one of one of the things I did this year was actually I I'm, I I went I left Facebook, deleted Facebook, I left Instagram, uh, and I got away from Stories. <laughs> and then on Twitter, which I'm still on, they introduced Stories. Just they call them fleets, but it's exactly the same thing. And I I don't use them, but they take up space, of course, in my app. So now I'm I'm on my phone. I've had to move to Tweetbot to actually avoid them because they're not impl- implemented in third party apps anymore. Or yet, I mean. So I'm trying to my hardest to avoid them because I just don't understand what they're doing there. It's, well, I do think this, so this is really fascinating because we used to joke, I mean, we still do joke about in, in product mm. um, development and how you get feature creep in products mm. um, always to the point where the product adds a chat function. That's kind of like, it's a joke that we've had for years that, you know, you keep on adding features and eventually yeah. you'll, you'll have a chat function. Now, what seems to have happened is that we've, we've trumped the chat feature and that we get now, once you've already got the chat feature, you then move on to adding stories. That seems to be <laughs> the thing that every product adds. Now, mm. if you've got something that, you've got a product and then stories are then added to that mm. and stories are like generic and added to all these different products, what are you doing now? What is, what's the point of the products if now stories are so important that they need to be there as well? Mm. I, this, this, I'm, I'm really unsure about you know the mutual value creation and what's going on with this thing when we've got stories absolutely everywhere and, and people post the same stories to multiple platforms. They don't, they don't, right. they don't create different stories. Mm. So this is this is an ubiquitous. This is just something. It's the same thing. You're just pushing it in different places. So, right. did you mention LinkedIn? I mean, stories. LinkedIn has stories. Yes, yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's oh, so, oh, I'm just. But the product. So the product is stories. Mm. So where's the stories app? Mm. Uh, right. And then something that uh, was also, actually brought up when when, when uh, Twitter was introducing fleets. Uh, when I'm top of mind with what we talked about with Lisa's article as well is, is that people became afraid that okay, so there's one more channel now for people to abuse me. Uh, and that also disappears. Yeah. So you actually have to be there and make a screen dump if you want to have it actually uh, documented if there's something that's going on that there's that is of abusive behavior. Yeah. And and also, yeah, you, 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 you don't get the preview as such, really. So you can get some, you can be hit by shocking content too because yes, and exactly. that's what we've seen in, mm. you know, in Twitch as well, or some of the other mm. video platforms that you can have something starting off looking innocent mm. and then it quickly switches to something nasty. Yeah, you can have something think, flashing that creates uh, epilepsy attacks as well. Yeah, yeah. But then you've also got a, a fascinating thing with a lot of these ones like, uh, like Twitter that you start off with a very simple product with a, you know, a chronological series of tweets, you know, of, of updates, sharing content. Facebook as well. You start off with things coming in chronological order. And then over time, they start adding um, adverts. They start introducing algorithms. The algorithm then is choosing what what order things go in. And we've all fought with, you know, had those fights with the kind of top stories or recent, and it keeps going back to top mm-hmm. every single time in all these platforms. And, you know, you keep getting more and more frustrated that your content isn't coming in the right order anymore. So what do they do? They introduce something <laughs> at the top. <laughs> That kind of does oh. what the original mm. thing did all those years ago, but they messed it up. Yeah, we screwed up the first part uh, because we wanted to make more money uh, or whatever the effort, <laughs> the reason for the effort. And so they have to introduce something else that actually uh, adheres more to the actual needs of the users. Mm. We are basically, we're touching on the fact that it's engagement again, isn't it? It's A lot of these products are pushed by engagement levels, mm. not actually useful features for the people that are there and said if every product has stories what are the products mm. right and if they cared about what i as a user how i experienced this they would actually allow, allow me to turn it off uh, but there's no such especially thing. if it's not the core uh, essence of why right. your product exists that's I mean, spotify I'd... for example uh, it's really really not something that's core to spotify um, yeah, same for twitter it... twitter's always been very streamlined this is what it is 
and and the, this adds to the complexity. And but even more, Spotify. I agree. I mean, Spotify yeah. for me is listening to music. Mm. And LinkedIn <laughs> stories on LinkedIn. Hmm. Well, I'm sure there. <laughs> I'd love to see. I'm, I think this is. Like I've said this is really fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see research behind it. I'd love to be part of the decision process mm-hmm. to see, you know, this is why we need more openness in kind of hypotheses and why we're working on stuff. You know, in some ways, I'd be happy if they just came out and said, look, we've added this because everyone else has got it and we need to keep engagement up. All right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Least, I would uh, love that transparency. Because at it, least we understand where they're coming from. Because the thing is, they've, they've done a really, really poor job of communicating to us why they added it, haven't they? Uh, it would be interesting for someone. Have they done at all? Uh, would if someone launched a stories app that is just stories, would people rush over there to sign up and get it? That would be really interesting for me. That would be a fantastic experiment mm-hmm. because if stories are only interesting if you already have something and you're it's forced upon you, then that's just abusive. <gasps> Can you have a stories app that connects to all these other services and pulls the stories in from there? It's like reverse buffer. So mm. you actually can just see all the stories in one place so you don't need to lose any of the others. I'm sure someone's building it. Yeah, they are now. <laughs> well, recommended listening after all that. Let me see if I can find the tab I'm supposed to be on to see what the recommended listening is. <laughs> oh, yeah, and recommended listening, you've, you've put down episode 138, uh, which is Education and Leadership with Yevgenia Grinblow and Melissa Perry. It's actually a two-parter. It's 138 oh, yes. and 139. That was one of our first two-parters. Yes. Mm. It, it, was a, it was an excellent conversation. It was a conversation based on a conversation. So we recorded mm. it in Lisbon, UXLX. Mm. And we'd, we'd been chatting to, uh, to Jenny and Melissa um, the night before on a boat, if I remember correctly. Yes. And, um, and then we pulled them in to have a chat with them um, while recording. And we had a great conversation about, and some of these points that Lisa brings up, we talked about back then with the journey from junior to senior and the importance of having good leadership and so on. It was a, exactly. there two, two wonderful women in design who um, I'm not going to, uh, no, I'm going to lift them because they, they do really good stuff. Um, and remember, those were the sure. days when we actually went to conferences and were there physically and we went to, together on boat trips and to restaurants. I mean, just that memory is, is bringing me back. <laughs> we, should, we should play out with Vera Lynn when we'll meet again. That's yes. Right. And if you have a little bit of time to spare, then you can join our community of volunteers. Just send us an email. We're always looking for more help. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. Did you hear that production was down at Santa's workshop? No, James, I didn't hear. Why is production down at Santa's workshop? Uh, Because many of his workers had to elf-isolate.